Okay, good morning, dear colleagues, members of the expert group, and all attendees of this um, seminar. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Special thanks goes to the group of distinguished experts who accepted the invitation of Eden to take part uh, at this meeting. Uh, we have reached um, in course of the project an uh, important point in its roadmap uh, <clears throat> to uh, discuss with um, an expert group and in the presence of the international community uh, the achievements of the project and uh, uh, discuss and uh, confirm and uh, validate parts of the new knowledge which have been acquired in course of the project uh, implementation. Um, let me mention that for Eden, it was uh, very relevant uh, and uh, valuable uh, to take part in the work of this project. Um, lots of uh, new knowledge has been uh, produced uh, in course of the project uh, implementation, and um, uh, this new knowledge structured as well along relevant goals and uh, aims. Uh, the the theme of this um, uh, project is uh, uh, one of the cutting edge issues, which is uh, worldwide uh, relevant and uh, in parallel uh, uh, investigated, researched, uh, uh, but also put in uh, praxis and then evaluated. I trust that the uh, relevance and importance uh, of this uh, uh, project uh, in the last couple of years, uh, when the project consortium was uh, working on it, has even been significantly increased. And uh, I trust no being one of the uh, most important issues when um, we are discussing the development and future of uh, education. Uh, this has been a pretty ambitious uh, project in its uh, goal settings and also during the uh, implementation and the uh, work within the consortium. Uh, I should uh, appreciate the uh, very systematic leadership of the project coordinator uh, in this respect. Um, so, all in all, uh, this is also an uh, important um, venture, if you wish, for Eden uh, to uh, be part of all of this work. And uh, being a European association, we do our best to share uh, the new knowledge and the achievements uh, of this project in the European and uh, worldwide educational community and um, try to disseminate it uh, validate it uh, and uh, increase the outreach and the impact uh, of this uh, uh, micro credentialing in higher education. I wish you an excellent meeting and uh, symposium. And uh, again, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andras. 
And now I would like to ask all pan panel members to shortly introduce themselves. Uh, I recommend to start in alphabetical order just as it is listed on uh, the expert panel members list. So first, maybe uh, Deborah is on the list. Deborah is not present. Then, please, Paul, could you introduce yourself? Unmute, unmute your camera first. Right. So, um, just having to reorient re, uh, myself to um, Adobe Connect. I've been using Teams and, and Zoom a lot, so switching back. But I have used Adobe Connect in the past. It will probably all come back. Sorry for the uh, uh, complications with the microphone. Yeah, I'm Paul Baxage uh, from uh, living in, in Sheffield and uh, working for Matic Media and a number of other companies. Um, uh, also, uh, I'll explain one or two key projects in a minute. One uh, also um, professor of practice at the University of the West Indies, which is quite interesting because it is very much it fo follows a full UK standard academic approach but in a way not inconsistent with the US and much of its funding for developments comes from Canada so we get exposed to a lot of ideas from the north of North America so it's kind of strange kind of international cockpit there but but useful and I'm also visiting professor at the University of Derby which has a long track record in, uh, in online learning and in in micro credentials though they wouldn't use that word um, do you want me to say what, a little bit about projects or, or uh, not much? I'll say a little. Uh, not, not, not at that point, Paul. Later on. Years ago. Yeah, later okay. on. It will come. That's sufficient. Thank you. Stage. Okay. Thank you. Then I think Lisa, please. Okay. My name is Lisa Marie Blast. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, yes, yes, yes. Uh, my name is Lisa Marie Blaska, and I'm Program Director uh, for the Management of Technology and Enhanced Learning Master's Program at the University of Oldenburg. Uh, and I'm in Oldenburg, or not in Oldenburg, I'm in Germany at the moment, Southern Germany. Uh, and uh, more recently, I've taken on a research uh, position with at the Duale Hochschule Baden-Württemberg, um, who are also part of this project. Um, and uh, my history, basically, I've worked with Eden for many, many years uh, as part of the executive committee, and now as the board, uh, as, as the chair of the board of Eden Fellows. Uh, and prior to that, I've uh, taught uh, as an instructor, uh, associate professor for University of Maryland and for Oldenburg, um, as well as worked in industry for SAP as uh, head of their information development division um, for over a decade. So that's my history in a nutshell. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. So, and then I ask Mark. Mark, do you hear me? Hello, Mark. Do you hear me? Mark, it's your turn. Mark, you are muted. Please turn your mic on. You need the sign language or the big notice. Mike, may I May I ask you to start your introduction? I think Mark is not with us, so then I would like to ask Claudio to self-introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. I'm Claudio Dondi. You may have seen uh, 
in the executive of uh, Eden and uh, working uh, in the field of technology and learning for many years. Now I'm uh, an independent uh, expert enjoying a more relaxed style of life in Brussels. I thank you for inviting me to this exchange and uh, that's all as an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Then I would like to ask Helga. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Just to do the sound check again. Okay. Yes, so yes, yes. Wonderful. So my name is Helga Dorner and I am a, a senior lecturer at the Central European University and I'm also the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at, at CU in Hungary, based currently in Budapest, but kind of moving to Vienna from next um, academic year onwards. Um, so, and I am also an, uh, an executive committee member of the, uh, of the Eden, and, uh, and I have been a member of this wonderful community for many, many years, and I also served on the network of academic professionals board or committee. So uh, it's, again, a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you very, very much, Helga, to be with us and taking the, the role of expert panel member today. Uh, I might ask Mark again, maybe he is already with us. Mark. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I was just uh, distracted for a second. Um, my name is Mark Brown. Uh, I am based at Dublin City University as director of the National Institute for Digital Learning. Uh, I'm also uh, an Eden executive member and also involved in a number of micro-credentialing initiatives, both in Ireland and on the European Commission's consultation group. So interested to engage over the course of the morning. Thank you very much, Mark. We all know you, I think, and I would like to ask Vlad Mialescu to introduce himself. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Vlad Mialescu. I am a, a lecturer at the Politecnica University of Timisoara. Uh, I have been working uh, for the Center of Business Education and E-Learning for the past 10 years. Uh, I have a PhD in MOOCs, and my research is uh, oriented around e-learning. In the past years, I've been involved in a lot of European projects uh, with uh, a component of digital badges and micro-credentials. Uh, recently, we wrote, a pay we wrote a proposal for a project uh, where we will coordinate it uh, related to blockchain with another very strong uh, component on uh, micro-credentials. Recently, I've, been, uh, I've joined the Eden NAP uh, steering committee. Uh, and I am very happy to be here with all of you. Looking forward to a great uh, workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. And then uh, I just realized that Deborah arrived, so I might ask Deborah to introduce herself shortly. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Sorry, sorry, I was I was late. Um, I was in another meeting which ran over. Um, uh, yes, so hello everybody, there's some familiar faces here, um, several familiar faces, <laughs> I think I, almost, I know everybody. Uh, so yes, I'm Deborah Arnold, I am International and National Projects Coordinator at ONEGE, uh, which is the French Digital University for Economics and Management. Um, I'm currently coordinating the Erasmus Plus project ECHO, which is the... Um, European Credentials Clearinghouse for Opening Up Education and we're looking at digital credentials and micro-credentials in particular and uh, some people around the table here, uh, Irina uh, is a uh, partner in that project at uh, the ABV as well so uh, we're interested in really linking the issues raised from and, and EADTU, sorry George um, uh, so we're very interested in linking um, the, the findings from uh, micro HE to the, the ongoing work in, um, in ECHO. Thank you very much, Deborah, joining us. And last but not least, I would like to ask George Eubach to introduce himself. Yes, good morning, uh, George Eubach. I'm the managing director of EDTU. 
and uh, we are uh, also very much involved in micro topic of micro credentials, um, more in relation to our short learning programs uh, initiative and project ESLP on short learning programs. And our European MOOC Consortium, um, as ED2 is running the European MOOC Consortium representing FutureLearn Fund, maybe Open uh, near other it and Open about. And in that uh, respect, we have developed the Common Micro Credentials Framework and are involved in Deborah's uh, ECHO project. Thank you, George. Uh, we learned it now that we have to learn a lot from. Uh, them uh, some ourselves because there are so many similar or parallel running projects and they are all concern in some way the short learning programs or the uh, micro credential uh, issues so I think it's a very very good team that uh, just gathered here today uh, my role is now to present the agenda uh, we are already uh, at the point uh, when we are over the introduction of the panel members so it will be followed by an introduction uh, about the context, the contributions of the micro HE projects to the developments of this area, and the doc documents to be discussed, and the questions to be answered. This is just the outline. Then it will be followed by a presentation of Dinesh Zarka about the credit supplement. The learning passport produced by the OE passport project will serve as the credit supplement and uh, Dina Zarka worked in the OES project as well uh, and then we start the, uh, the real uh, discussion this will be uh, organized in two panel discussion uh, the, the first part will discuss the first set of questions that concern the produced documents and uh, uh, the developments uh, that we produced in micro HE and the second panel will be about the future about the expectations about the present uh, initiatives already running and uh, each panel discussion will be organized in two rounds the first round uh, will be just the primary notes and comments on the documents or the questions raised and the second one is uh, for the reflections uh, to each other's uh, opinion uh, just to to uh, approach a kind of a stand, uh, common uh, approach to these questions and uh, it will be just summarized uh, shortly after 12 o'clock uh, and I think I will do this uh, role and then close the workshop at about 12.30. So let's start first discussing the context and the documents produced. Uh -huh, I see. Okay, so the current trends in higher education uh, has got many different aspects. One aspect is that the del delivery methods changed. Part of the degree courses are also provided in digital or blended form, and this got a very strong push in uh, the time of the epidemic, uh, the COVID-19. We know that it was a kind of an emergency distance uh, learning, not a well-designed and uh, based initiative. And also in response to the labor market needs, uh, shorter, more specific, more industry-specific courses for delivered, which also initiated a kind of a modularization in higher education when smaller, well-defined chunks are delivered in SLP short learning program forms like MOOCs just to make the most impressive example and that raised the question as how to credentialize and recognize the outcomes of these short learning programs and other learning uh, open learning achievements with micro credentials so this gave birth to the uh, concept of the micro uh, credentials what are macro credentials? 
just to get the wider scope, an education credential is a documented statement that acknowledges a person's learning outcomes. A micro-credential is a subunit of a credential that could accumulate into a larger credential or degree to be part of a portfolio. Well, I think that these definitions are, are debated and there is just a current consulting group uh, clarifying the issue and trying to get uh, uh, just a, a common understanding of the, the definition. Uh, we know that a short, short learning program, these are these uh, group, uh, short degree program of a, is a group of courses with a common subject focusing <coughs> on specific needs and typically part of a larger degree and typically somewhere between 5 to 30 ECTS units. The current debate of recognition of, uh, of micro credentials <coughs> is mainly focused on the questions how and under what conditions are they recognized by higher education institutions and in the labor market. I think uh, for both uh, the most important thing is that they should allow to explore the micro credentials requirements and evidence of learning. So they, they should have some certain, certain, certain technical value and uh, the necessary metadata. For the higher education institutions, it has to be accredited and measured in ECTS credit values and necessarily has to have the same assessment and identity verification or authentication as any part of the respectively accredited degree program. And to make the recognition easier, uh, I think that uh, recognition in the same higher education institution is straightforward and uh, much easy, easier. But on the other hand, if uh, it is about the recognition of the SLP results in other institutions, uh, it should be based on mutual recognition. There are some examples of, of that or that should be ensured at a system level, which is not, that, not yet developed. What do you mean on you know, quality? To make it very shortly, it just uh, was a much longer debate. Uh, to reach a high quality for a micro credential, the statement has to be distinct, authentic, accessible, exchangeable, and portable. I think we all know the, result, the meaning of this short terms. To reflect on the above needs, we started the micro IG project and we use micro credentials related to the micro qualifications of EQF. Uh, our focus in this project was the higher education sector, uh, the learning programs above five LCTS units, and we tried to create a structure we try to categorize the different micro credentials that already uh, just are flourishing in the literature. We try to specify a required metadata system that should facilitate, facilitate the recognition process in or outside a certain uh, institution. The aims of the workshop are manifold. First, we have to validate uh, the briefing paper, which was based <coughs> on a survey, <coughs> I will talk about it later. The credit supplement, which we use for that reason, is the OEPAS learning passport. The results of the expert workshop, which also contained an overlook to the future or the expectations. It was a, a masterclass held in BLED last November. And we try to form expert opinion and answer to a set, answer a set of collective questions posed in advance. So first about the briefing paper. It summarized the results of the survey on the use of micro credentials. It's a kind of a state of art review. We asked 100 or over 100 institutions uh, among uh, teachers, students, decision makers, and employers about their opinion on micro credentials. I have to stress that we try to cover all stakeholders, groups, all 
role players in the microcredential ecosystem, and we concluded that institutions lack understanding of microcredentials, partly because there is no widely accepted uh, common definition of microcredentials. The adoption of microcredentials uh, is prevented also by the lack of a common recognition mechanism, even within a country, not, not to mention uh, among different uh, countries, and also by inadequate resource allocation for SRP adoption and development, which is also uh, influenced by the questions of profitability of starting SRPs. And if profitability runs parallel uh, with the, the adoption, which is also meaning that there is a good business model to develop and uh, implement SRPs. And uh, last but not least, flexibility, personalization, and recognition are critical when using short learning program to respond to the demands of the labor market and the uh, higher education institutions. The, the credit supplement is the learning passport developed by the OE Plus project. The credit supplement creates a digital standard format for doc documenting education credentials in ECTS units in terms of our awarding body, credential awarded, holder of credential, and evidence of achievement. The next presentation by Dina Zarka will describe it in more detail. And third, the masterclass event in BLED. Uh, there's a full description of this event uh, just linked to your invitation. And I don't want to go through all the details. I just would like to quote one very important uh, comment of Maria Sticci Damiani, the lead author of the ECTS user guide that to be fully aligned with the European higher education area, we have to consider adding a new section on micro-credentials to the European standards and guidelines, like half a page on micro-credentials on the basis of the standards. And we need to add a supplement to the micro-credential to indicate the learning outcomes, the level, the number of credits, the quality assurance, and the teaching and learning approaches which is a kind of a um, set of requirements we have to set satisfy when we try to build the macro credentials as part of the credentialing system. Uh, the questions addressed in this uh, expert panel are grouped into two big categories. The first category uh, is uh, the documents provided, the br uh, briefing paper, the OEPAS learning passport, the results of the SBLED expert workshop, uh, the micro HE meta standards, and the credentify.eu, which is an implementation of the meta data standards in form of a warehouse. And the second part is about the plans, the feedback, the expectations. Uh, I mean, what did your institution plan? Uh, about offering uh, micro-credentials, in which way, in which subjects, what are the concrete plans to recognize micro-credentials, it's the other part of the, the, the coin, because it's not about delivering the courses, but recognizing micro-credentials, in which way, in wh which subject, which is the feedback of the present uh, expert discussion, uh, what do you expect from a user guide on micro-credentials, if it will be developed for higher education institutions, I think it should be developed in some way to make the uh, roadmap of introducing micro-credentials uh, in higher education institutions easier and to make them easier to recognize uh, all over in Europe. And could you point us any other related initiatives in the field? I think you could, as we already heard in the introduction. Well, I don't want to list this uh, relation because you should all know that, nothing new in it. 
uh, the potential building blocks of a European approach to micro credentials should include the, the following uh, parts or issues. It is just a quote from the background paper of the first meeting of the consulting group of the EU Commission, which was held on 26 of May. There should be a common and transparent definition of micro credentials. There should be a link to the European qualification framework defining the levels, the learning out outcomes. There should be a quality assurance standard for providers and courses. It should be related to ECTS units, defined learning outcomes and workload. There should be a part about recognition for further studies and also for employment purposes. Uh, it should have digital tools for issuing credentials, for offering access to micro-credentials, to store credentials, to share credentials and guidance. And there should be a business model and of engagement of practitioners. So the micro-credentials subject is already on the agenda at EU level. I just mentioned here three very important initiatives. First, uh, there are standards on digital credentials that are being developed see the European Digital Credential Infrastructure of the European Commission. There is the Action 3 of the Digital Ac Education Action Plan that proposes the integration of digitally signed qualifications to Europass that will include an e-portfolio, an online tool for users to describe their skills, finding interesting jobs and learning opportunities, some information on working and studying in different EU countries, and digital credentials, free tools and software for institutions to issue digital temper-proof qualifications and other learning credentials. I think the last one that are the most relevant for this workshop. And there is also the EU decision, uh, Article 4.6, that specified that Europass shall support authentication services for any digital documents or presentations of information on skills and qualifications. So just without summarizing these all initiatives, I would like to thank you for joining this uh, expert panel. And then I would like to give the, the floor to Diner Zarka, director of the Engineering Further Education Center of BME, to have his presentation on the learning supplement. Please, Diner, follow me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Terence, and uh, good morning. Morning, everybody. Um, a short introduction. Uh, Lina Zaka working in uh, Budapest University of Technology and Economics, electrical engineer and um, an instructional designer almost for now. And I was uh, in the um, team of working out uh, in a way pass a learning passport and test it as well. And I would like to speak a little bit uh, about this. Um, I still uh, use um, uh, my camera freeze, but anyone, uh, anybody who is not satisfied with it, I can initiate it. I hope that I can move the uh, slides. OK. Uh, first, I would like to, uh, if, you, if you look at the title, it is Learning Passport as a credit supplement to be used. But the credit supplement in something is uh, we don't exactly know what it is. So why do we supplement? We know the diploma supplement, and now we are, we, we are uh, well, uh, talking about credit supplement. But what is the difference? So uh, the first, I would like to talk about the similarity and then the difference. So um, the diploma supplement and the credit supplement are similar because all, both of them are breaking down a larger entity. When we supplement the diploma, then we are breaking down the title of the diploma to subject and the subject with at least the, the titles and the learning outcomes of those subjects. While in the um, 
credit supplement, we break down um, a smaller part of the learning to detailed learning outcomes and further uh, to learning experience sometimes. So this is really uh, the internal micro life of uh, learning achievements. The second similarity is that um, what both of them are contextualizing the standardized course or diploma to the given um, award. So in a diploma supplement, uh, it is written what was really done uh, during the, the student's um, um, diploma uh, pathway. And also this um, uh, credit supplement is uh, telling exactly what was done. So uh, not in theory, but in real terms, what was achieved. But there are differences as well, because as we, from credentials, we went to micro-credentials, then uh, the supplement from, went from um, diploma level to credit level. And I would like to explore the differences, because there are large differences between a diploma supplement and the credit supplement, which we used in OEPAS um, project uh, as a learning passport. Um, uh, when we designed the learning passport, uh, we categorized, uh, categorized the educational credentials as such in four big categories. The formal qualifications, like diplomas, the non-formal certificates, any kind, recognitions of skills, for example, um, a language exam, and records of experience, for example, um, a summer placement of a student. So out of those four, we uh, were dealing more with the non-formal uh, certificates because uh, we were dealing with open educational experience, uh, rather the formal things. However, the outcome is pretty uh, usable in formal environments. So just to show you, um, uh, those are the examples of non-formal credentials, like, and we were, uh, parents already told about this, nano degrees, micro masters, um, endorsements, uh, non-qualification credentials, licenses, and badges, open badges. Oops, it went quite quickly. So, uh, in the OA patch project, when we were um, designing the uh, learning passport, we wanted to create a digital standard format for documenting and open educational credentials based on ECTS. And if we have a time and technical possibility, I would like to share my screen to go to the OEPAS um, uh, site to, to show one uh, learning passport. So this learning passport is a little bit different from uh, the diploma supplement because it is defining exactly the overarching body and not only the name of it. Um, it is defining exactly the credential that is awarded, also defining the user, the holder of the credential, but also there are uh, possibilities to give evidence to this achievement. Now, first, I would like to talk a little bit, bit about the awarding body. So, apart from the full name, we uh, give the possibility to put here uh, the public key, the exact address, uh, digital and, and the physical address of the awarding body. If there is a digital stamp or seal of the institution, what is the exact accreditation line of the institution and the website or URL? of the awarding body. That's what I would like to show you with one example later. Um, this, uh, it's a swap of, uh, of my slides. Sorry, I would li have liked to start with this, but uh, this whole structure is a user-friendly one, standardized um, using controlled vocabulary uh, in, as 
many times as possible and uh, there is a growing list of uh, shared learning passports sorry about that so then uh, uh, would come the awarding body and then uh, much more information about the educational credential itself so on the first slide um, we start with the official title of it an identifier uh, of this credential a short uh, free text description of it also free text learning outcome description we would like to categorize the credential like BA or BSc, MA, MSc, PhD uh, whether it's an ECTS type or ECVET type or other credential type in national context and the subject itself in which context this educational credential was uh, issued but the list is continuing with uh, what are the ways of acquire this credential for example is it a formal non-formal or informal type of education what is the grading scheme even in Europe we have many many different grading schemes to A to D or 1 to 20 or 1 to 5 and there is a possibility to choose um, um, a grading scheme uh, in this part of the learning passport the mode of study whether it's online or face to face or blended or what kind of study we also uh, ask uh, and show um, the in in this uh, passport what is the unique of the workload whether it's learning hours or weeks or years um, what is the assessment method uh, in the credential is it on-site or it is uh, an online with identification of the user or online without the identification of the user or other type of assessment method the level of learning which is is it in the national qualification framework context or is it the European qualification framework work or and in by this one what is the level for example fourth level EQF level number of credit points that was awarded what is the accreditation uh, especially this program what is the home page of the program and uh, whether this um, uh, credential is stackable which means is it a part of the bigger uh, credential for example a diploma and here we have um, some information about the over the the student uh, him or herself the family name the given the name the date of birth the student ID or uh, any other specific identification code uh, the date of the award the expiry of the the credential if any if uh, how many credits were awarded and uh, if, if there is any supplementary evidence other than the passport you can upload here so those are the information about the holder of the educational credential and their accomplishment and now this is the fourth part is the supplementary evidence so there is a, a possible link to the individual credential evidence and also possibility of unlimited uh, further evidences that the learning passport creator can link here and now uh, it was quite easy this four part of the learning passport and I'm just asking Dora whether I can share my screen or you can um, help me to to make this uh, link live Okay. I am a host, so uh, now I have to find how to share my screen, which is. Uh, uh, 
now video attendees right and uh, sorry a few minutes of discovering the sharing possibility Okay, maybe, um, um, Dura, maybe, okay, right, what, share, okay. Share my screen, uh, that's it. Uh, share. And now um, I would like to just get you a feedback whether whether you see now we have okay I have already do you see the learning passport now? Just an aura, as I don't see anything, just an aura, yes or no. So um, normally on my screen, we I see the practical management of constructor risk in the construction in, uh, industry. This is the title what I see. There are some. I can see okay. that. Okay, some people are uh, already see that they you see the uh, pa uh, the passport. Okay. Right. Um, so in the passport, I would like to show you um, an adult learning course that was passported, and. Um, here, the first part of the passport is information about the awarding body. And here we see the full name of my university uh, with the breaking down to the Institute of Continuing Edu Engineering and Education. Um, the second uh, information is the accreditation of the institution. Uh, we gave two accreditation. One is the uh, Hungarian uh, University uh, accreditation with identifier of the university, but also my institute is um, uh, ISO standard uh, uh, accredited by ISO standards. So we put here those uh, accreditations. And if you see, there is a website URL when uh, you can go uh, further by this ISO accreditation or maybe this is no this is the list of university accreditations in Hungary the second part is the information about the credential itself so the official title of the credential you see and then um, a, a free text a description of the credential so this is a 20 hours further educational face to face and blah 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 so this is quite understandable um, the subject is management and building industry and this is another type of uh, uh, credential uh, here uh, we see the learning outcome uh, descriptions of uh, the 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 course by the end of the course learner is, is able to this or that ways to acquire a credential is a validation of a formal learning grading scheme as it is um, adult education pass or fail on the exam and the threshold of passing is 60 percent of uh, of the, um, the 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 old points okay 
then this is um, we go more down on the road. Um, the models of study online face to face and part time, 20 hours. We uh, measure the um, uh, uh, the learning in hours. This is uh, online assessment with ID uh, verification through Moodle system. Um, the cheating prevention is not filled out, but uh, there is an automatic grading, uh, quiz testing, and um, again there is an ISO um, uh, accreditation uh, link here where you can see the registration code and everything because it is the specific uh, course uh, accreditation and you see the home page of the credential. I tried to push in it and Deora will tell me if it is visible or anybody else. No, not here. Sorry. Yes. And this is uh, the credential here, you see. And then um, there is an information block. Um, just no problem. Um, uh, if we still share my screen, um, the last block I would like to show is uh, is the information about the test uh, credential holder and uh, this is my name and many other things and uh, of course um, there is a link of the open badge that Moodle is uh, Moodle is giving to the uh, to the person who was uh, making it there is a small trick because I was not the learner of the course, so I was showing um, a course attendees um, um, open batch here uh, for testing purposes, but it could be solved if, if it's a real um, if it's a, a, a real um, a learning passport. And this is more more or less the end of uh, my presentation. Thank you, and go back. Uh, Let's go back to the normal non-shared um, mode. Thank you. I hope that uh, most of you saw something uh, about uh, the learning passport. That's how it worked. And uh, by the testing, we, uh, we were just um, Telling the uh, the uh, authors uh, in KAC Malta, who was uh, coordinating this development work, that the uh, at the part of the accreditation fields there was some um, um, not really um, uh, clean uh, things what to put them, and also the student identification was. Uh, a bit different from the Hungarian requirements, so there there was a need of adjustment. Thank you for the um, your listening, and this is the end of the learning passport. So the credit supplement um, presentation. Uh, thank you, Dinesh. It was highly appreciated uh, because it gave some example, and uh, the content became more plausible, and we would have some hands-on experience how it this look looks like in in practice because you do it and also because it just built a bri bridge between the macro credentials as we use in the macro he project and the digital badges which you use just to have the, all the metadata plus a digital picture of the credential which is really very a good illustration of the point we would like to discuss uh, today so um, one, one word parent that uh, what I didn't say so after this presentation you can see how we moved from the diploma supplement quite rigid and simple structure to a much meaningful 
uh, information set uh, that I could uh, show you. Thank you. Definitely, I think it's the, the way to go. Otherwise, you could uh, otherwise you couldn't construct the macro credentials in a way that is uh, reliable, verifiable, uh, retraceable, and and uh, recognizable uh, at the end. So it is a very very uh, strong contribution. Uh, I ma might have to uh, just add to this presentation that this sort of data is a collection of data that can be translated into machine readable form if you use the same language all together and then it could serve as the metadata for the uh, micro-credential when it is all uh, appearing in digital form in the data warehouse like in the credentify.aeu initiative just suggests. So at that point I think we are just keeping our time very, very uh, precisely. And then I would like to start the first round of the panel discussion with asking the questions concerning the first part of this uh, expert uh, discussion, starting with the briefing paper, the learning passport, and the results of the, of the BLED masterclass. Uh, uh, we could go on two different ways. One way, if we go uh, along the alphabetic order of experts, which is also possible, or we just could ask you to raise your hands and whoever has got something to say, then uh, he or she would like to get the floor to answer. What do you recommend? Could you just put in the presenter's box? Either way, raise your hand, raise your hand. Well, I think that the raise your hand approach is stronger <laughs> in the, the group, so uh, I suggest to raise your hands and then I, I will give the floor to anyone who raised her or his hands. So, we are just start. Paul has already raised his hand, so I think, uh, Paul, you can start. Okay, thank you for that um, uh, generosity. I, I, it might be helpful for me to start because I'm, I, I suspect I may, may have been the, the least involved with, uh, with, with this project up to now, even from the point of view of, of watching it. I did, have a, I did attend a workshop, I think, in Dublin, um, and I do quite a lot of work in this area in that sort of typical British way. Um, which is possibly somewhat different. So some of the questions may help to help to um, uh, minimise time later. So if I just start with a couple of, of scoping questions, uh, as people like Cloudy would know, there was a period when every year we would ask the EU officials, the high EU officials, off the record about um, uh, EC vet, and they'd all get very embarrassed. Um, sometimes they would admit what was happening, and I think that gives rise to a big issue because are we talking about higher education qualifications, or are we including what are called, uh, in the British jargon, higher vocational qualifications? And before you say they're completely different, I'm afraid the market does not judge that as the case, and particularly apprenticeships in the UK operate in a hybrid fashion between these. So that, that to me, that's a very important philosophical question. So perhaps I just, I, I'll leave that I'll, let me raise the other big philosophical question. It's often assumed from agencies like uh, UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning, from which we get a lot of advice in the Caribbean, whether we want it or not, if I can put it that way. Um, they basically, a lot of this in their mind goes along with competence-based assessment. Um, and I suspect that the, the, the feeling here is that that's, that's not mandatory. It may be a good idea. 
but it's not mandatory. Whereas, you know, there was a strong confidence-based movement, the Foghorn from southern New Hampshire and the rest. Um, you know, but I presume that's that's optional, if, uh, if if at all. But the big the philosophical question, I think, is about the whole relation with, with the EC vet and indeed the national vet systems. Um, because leaving them out give, actually means a lot of trade craft is, is then not available. Um, putting them in probably raises questions of time scale, scope, money, and everything else. So perhaps I'll just stop at that point. These were the questions I asked, I think, people involving Deborah at, at, and ICD in Dublin um, in a rather brief meeting on the topic. So I'll just leave it there to start with. So, Deborah? Deborah? Sorry, just needed to activate my uh, microphone. Uh, yes, Paul, I think this this question of uh, uh, competence-based assessment is, uh, is, is a big one. Um, looking at how that aligns or not to this focus on ECTS, and we've been having this discussion uh, within the ECHO project, um, and we decided to stick to ECTS for pragmatic reasons in that uh, it is the recognized currency. Uh, but we're also looking to see how, how much further we can go um, uh, in, in the whole competency approach. Um, I'd like to provide some feedback on the briefing paper because this was one of the questions that uh, we were asked. And I am uh, very external to micro HE. Uh, I just like to make that, that clear. Um, obviously, it interlinks with the work that we're doing in, in ECHO. Um, and so it's great to see how far forward things have already come uh, with, with micro HE. Uh, the briefing paper is lovely. Um, it's actually an enjoyable, meaningful uh, read. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, I'm going to make that recommended reading for all the ECHO partners uh, so that we're not um, reinventing the wheel uh, in, in what we're doing there. Um, the only other comment I would make um, uh, coming back to some of the developments that uh, I think Ferenc or Danish mentioned, I think it was Ferenc who did that at the beginning, um, in terms of aligning with uh, Europass and the EDCI model, um, that is something which, um, because ECHO only started in September, we're able to fully integrate already into the reflections. Um, so everything that's coming out of micro HE and OE pass are going to be fed in uh, to and already being fed into to what we're doing. Um, in terms of addressing this uh, from a higher education institution mutual recognition point of view, um, what we're aiming to do at, at, at system level, and it's already become quite well uh, developed, uh, and it will present, be presented at the Eden Annual Conference uh, online uh, in a couple of weeks' time uh, by Tim Reed, uh, is a model credit recognition agreement. Um, and this has come out through um, uh, scoping exercises, uh, interviews, examination of recognition processes amongst the partner countries. Um, and we've actually made it into uh, an almost final workable uh, WordPress form where uh, bipartite, tripartite agreements can be generated from the background database, all of which uh, is going to be EDCI compatible. Um, so um, uh, Tim Reed will be presenting that, all the work that we did on that. Um, and uh, just to encourage people to attend that session, if you're going to Eden, this paper has also been shortlisted for Best Paper Award at the Eden Conference. Um, so uh, that's a bit of self-promotion for the ECHO project, but it's just to, to show that um, all this really, really valuable work um, uh, in uh, the previous generation projects, if you like, is being taken forward. Um, and uh, We'll be happy to continue the conversation as well um, to, 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 to keep this area moving and get it aligned. Um, and of course, the whole take up thing, which is addressed in the briefing paper, is the main issue. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Who is next? 
I don't see Maybe Mark, could you comment? Happy to come in. Um, just following on from Deborah, the, the briefing paper um, I think is very timely for its contribution to helping us understand how messy the micro-credentialing landscape is. Um, the value of the paper is by looking at different stakeholders' perspectives um, and bringing those together and showing again that there is a challenge here because in searching for a definition, I think that process is actually um, something that needs to be educational. There's no point just having a, a definition and then imposing that. And there may be a lesson for us about the time frame that we need to work within. But my particular contribution, um, I have just three points I think I want to make. The one thing that perhaps I'd like to see a little more in the paper and in the discussions that are currently taking place is uh, around the deeper drivers. Why are we interested in micro-credentials? What is it that um, has generated this interest in micro-credentials? Um, and so by drivers, what I'm really getting at, and I'm going to share a link to quite a critical paper that's challenging um, the drive towards micro-credentialing from a neoliberal perspective, from a marketization of higher education, because in many respects we're dancing with the devil if we don't have these conversations. Um, almost to the point where this is potentially something that could be taken to the supermarket model of education. Um, and very hard to argue against because the learner is at the centre of this, choosing what it is that they want to study. But, you know, if I extend that metaphor, when we go to the supermarket, sometimes we choose things on the shelf that are not always good for us. Um, and it's not popular sometimes to suggest that the learner doesn't always know what's good for them. But that's the truth when it comes to our diet. Um, so, well, even we can be educated and we make bad choices. So I'll share the link to the paper I've referred to, but ultimately the why needs to come before the how and the what. And I just think we would benefit from a lot more figuring out what the why is. And actually the sort of underlying drivers are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but I think that conversation has not taken place in part because we've latched on to kind of a bandwagon if we're not careful. Uh, I often use the slogan that I repeat with a number of things, but I'll say it now. Micro-credentials should be in the service of big ideas. They are not the big idea itself. My second point, um, and I won't take much longer, I'm conscious of time here, is following what I've just described, I also think we need to be very mindful of the language we use and the metaphors we adopt. So um, some people might see me as being overly pedantic here. But even the concept of a passport, it's borrowed from another model or from somewhere else. So a passport suggests you have to get a stamp. Well, maybe you don't these days in the same way. But even in a European context, um, actually the mobility that we have, the freedom, the flexibility, we don't have to have those passports when we cross uh, borders as um, we once used to. So is the passport the right metaphor? Equally, I've argued in another context, because you, some of you will be aware that um, the concept of wallets are used often, that you have your learner wallet. For me, that's inherently sexist language. It's non-inclusive. Um, we would never talk about having a learner purse, um, I don't think, and no offence to anyone, I hope. But in addition to that, the idea of a learner wallet implies that somehow knowledge is your own commodity and you put it into your wallet. It's your personal commodity. And that flies against what I understand to be really common European, European values about the public nature of education. So these are tensions in that why discussion that if we're not careful can be embedded into our discourse. Um, so I've been a bit academic. Last point, um, but then I am an academic, just to qualify things. So these are conversations that do matter. Language matters. Um, the last point 
on on the kind of platform. So I'm going to go from a really theoretical thing down to some practicalities at the platform level. Um, I think Deborah made a very important point about the role the Euro Pass will play and how alignment needs to take place there. But actually, there are a number of very mature platforms right now that support micro-credentials. Um, at DCU, my own university, we're investing in one of those. It's the particular platform that's used in all of Australian universities, all of New Zealand universities, a good number of Irish universities, UK universities, and it's already the system we use to validate the, digitally our credentials. And at a practical level, as an institution, we would not want to have to integrate a new system, yet another system. We would want to build on a system that already talks to our student information system and our other systems. These are not inconsequential um, issues because at the moment our own university is investing in a new student information system and that's about a 20 million euro project um, when you look at the total cost of implementation. So I've probably taken more than enough time. Thank you, Mark. This was a very, very, very valuable contribution to the discussion anyway. And I see that uh, Claudio uh, is raising his hand, so I give the floor to Claudio. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, I also have to congratulate for, uh, for the good work that I could uh, read. I apologize, I didn't comment uh, by the eighth, as it was requested, because I needed a little bit more time to get uh, acquainted with the new things uh, that are happening in this domain. As Paul uh, marked, uh, I, I have uh, a, a feeling that uh, micro-credentials have a brighter future in uh, higher vocational education than in uh, mainstream higher education. That's uh, uh, and we can see the areas where they are developing are the areas of digital competencies, are the areas uh, of moving knowledge, uh, are the areas of short uh, courses uh, that are, by definition, the most dynamic part uh, of uh, what we can call higher education, and of course in continuing professional development. But I would like to follow also what Mark said, the why before the how. Um, when we started to talk about uh, open education, we were talking about the vision of lifelong learning in terms of freedom, of opportunity. And uh, now the, the credentialization element uh, is obliging us to talk about technical standards, is about uh, uh, recognition, certifications, uh, procedures, uh, regulators, uh, all sorts of things uh, that are not necessarily 100% uh, uh, coherent with the original ideas of the why of opening up education. Uh, there is an issue of uh, mindset, if not of visions of the world, behind uh, this. But there is also, and I would like, uh, while appreciating the, the, the document, in particular the um, what you call the briefing paper. The final part is rightly pointing a few key actors on which the, the study has been conducted. And then uh, there is this table, how will a micro-credential look like in 2025, that uh, puts uh, some uh, very, uh, very extreme views on what will happen on page 40 of this document. I think this uh, would uh, open, in my view, that's my advice, uh, the opportunity to ask uh, some other more fundamental questions related to the why and to the who. Who gains and who loses uh, if this is uh, adopted uh, in, uh, in a large scale. And uh, in my view, it is obvious that the ones who may gain, provided the standard can be found and the adoption can be generalized, is the credentializing body or bodies, those who make a business out of certifying. 
But the other actors that are mentioned in the table, I'm not so sure. I mean, students in principle may gain, but only those students who are entrepreneurial enough to go and choose bits and pieces to add to their curriculum. Um, employers may gain in terms of transparency. In fact, uh, this is uh, already used in the digital industry. But uh, small and medium uh, employers uh, used to check uh, and uh, certify competencies on the basis of uh, putting uh, people at work and observing them. So a credential is not uh, a normal currency in uh, a large part of the labor market. We must not forget that. The, um, the regulators, I think the regulators will invent each one a different system. So, okay, we can try to ally with the strongest of the regulation in our scenario today that may appear to be the European Commission, but there are other initiatives that are taken by, I don't know, I just uh, mentioned the initiative uh, uh, for individual learning accounts uh, supported by OECD or the French uh, government. I don't remember what's the name of the program. I think uh, there, there is a, a real problem of finding a single system. Uh, and finally, what, uh, why should higher education institution gain from this when uh, as, as it is observed by all commenters that are uh, looking how the present period of COVID has, in a certain sense, destabilized the, the dogma that higher education should be organized as it is. Why should they, in a sense, uh, destabilize their system by introducing an alternative credentializing system, by supporting it, uh, when, uh, um, when it is already put in discussion, I think uh, it, it's, very, it's very unlikely that the big core of higher education institution will support this. We have examples, of course, uh, open universities are to a large extent supporting it, and uh, um, a lot of uh, um, continuing higher education institutions that are providing uh, continuing professional development in a large extent are doing this. And so this is, uh, this, these are my doubts and my recommendation that there should be an exploration of the why the actors that are mapped in the study should, uh, what should they gain and why should they adhere to this or not. Thank you for the moment, it's all. Thank you very much, Claudio. You just stressed the importance of the question of why. That was also raised by Mark. And it's a very, very uh, timely question because we are already on, on the train to go somewhere. And we should know why we go this direction. Thank you. And then I have seen that Vlad is also raising his hand. So I give the floor to Vlad, please. Thank you, Ferenc. Um I was not uh, involved uh, actively in this project, so um, for me, um, giving, some, giving an opinion, I think, is uh, very objective, uh, since I was not influenced by uh, any um, ideas uh, um, from during the pro project. Uh, I have to say that reading this paper was absolutely wonderful, because it summarizes extremely well um, all the results of, the, of this project, uh, I love the, the diagrams, which uh, are very uh, clearly written. Uh, I think even for, for someone who has uh, no idea about uh, the topic, this is a, a very easy read. Uh, you, you manage very, a very, well, very good balance between uh, uh, an expert language and the readability. Um, I have uh, only uh, one... Uh, remark and one suggestion for, for the future. Uh, I would refer you to page 23 of, uh, of the paper where you talk about stackability and the fact that uh, many uh, people don't really know what stackability is. Maybe it would help if a short 
definition would be included on that page, uh, especially since uh, I also saw very good uh, short definitions for uh, micro credentials and SLPs. Um, as a suggestion for, for the future, now that we have this very good document related to uh, a quantitative research, uh, I think we need to try to see also, uh, uh, sorry, a qualitative research. I think we need to, to try and see also a quantitative one and try to, to uh, have um, um, some, some um, tens, hundreds of people in, various, uh, in the various uh, stakeholder groups to try to evaluate this so that we can have confirmation for, for this very good uh, work. Um, in relation to the passport, I uh, think that this is also very well balanced. Uh, the concept of less is more is uh, very well um, underlined here, and I think uh, it's, uh, the information here uh, is enough. I would uh, really try to disseminate this into several countries and to try to see if, uh, if how this works, how this will practically work with, uh, with the institutions and uh, the students. Um, other than that, I have to say that reading the expert workshop made me really sad that uh, I, I was not able to attend it. There are some very valuable key points there, and uh, I would uh, uh, refer to refer you to to the information related to blockchain in education, especially since uh, uh, in the project uh, that we we wrote a proposal for our friends from Malta. Uh, our partners, so um, I was uh, aware of some of their work, and uh, I think that uh, this is uh, one of the directions for the future uh, of uh, education and uh, micro credentials the way in which, by helping us with the blockchain technology, we can uh, move all of, uh, all of this to a greater scale. Uh, this is it until now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vlad. I just would like to add that a, quali a quantitative uh, discussion of the survey will also appear uh, in the literature. We are just planning to put one. Uh, the, uh, the University in Tampara is just proposed the paper, and the, I'll be joining them, so there will be a paper on that. Uh, it is more, more detailed than just this briefing paper. And uh, we are very happy to hear that you would like to, to disseminate uh, the results of the project. Uh, this was always will come. So <laughs> just uh, do that. And about blockchain, is still a debate whether to use the blockchain for this purpose or not. We suggested the blockchain structure, but it should be a kind of a European-wide uh, accepted uh, concept before, before we go ahead with it, because there are so many different kinds of blockchains. Uh, that we have, to, we have to agree on what kind of blockchain we use for that, who will support the blockchain, in what way, so it's not, not that easy to decide. And I was notified that uh, also Lisa is raising her hand, so I would like to put the floor to Lisa, please. Thank you, Ferenc. Um, I submitted my feedback already, but I wanted to discover, uh, just highlight some of the feedback that I gave so that the other panelists and the participants are aware of what the, that feedback was. Uh, I also want to congratulate the team on putting together a, a really comprehensive report. I agree with what uh, Deborah and Claudio and, and Vlad have said about, about it being just a really easy read and, and anyone who doesn't have a, an understanding of micro-credentials can, can get that from the paper. Um, and it also provides an excellent overview of, of the different initiatives that, that, you're in, that you've undertaken thus far. Um, my, my feedback is, is really, I've got, I've got a lot of um, comments in terms of, of, and I'm not going to go over all of the feedback that I gave in the, in the feedback report. I see lots of opportunities for synergies across the stakeholder groups using micro-credentials. Um, and I think we need to be careful not to focus too much only on higher education, but also um, other uh, other areas of, of, of education, such as vocational education, continuing professional education. Uh, this is particularly interesting for us uh, at the Center for Lifelong Learning. We've actually had prior learning assessment and recognition for the last, um, for over a decade at the university, as well as through our continuing education program. Um, students 
don't always take advantage of that uh, within traditional education, but they do take advantage of it through continuing. Um, and we've been uh, playing around with experimenting with, with, I guess, what you would call micro-credentials according to the definition that's been provided uh, in terms of professionalization uh, certificates, uh, certificates of advanced studies, diplomas of advanced studies, uh, which are anywhere between two and uh, 30 credits. So uh, I guess you could almost say, and then we recognize prior learning and informal learning based on uh, you know the, the student's experience. So we're actually doing uh, that uh, within our university uh, at, at Oldenburg. So uh, I see lots of opportunities um, for us to create synergies. Um, one of the things that I thought was really provocative in the, in the report and, and intriguing was the statement that future changes will be driven by people and not by universities. Uh, this is somewhat, somewhat um, in disagreement with what, what Claudio was saying about that higher education won't want to change. I actually agree with you. I don't think higher education will want to change. I, I think what we're seeing is a pushback from students, a pushback from um, uh, from industry uh, uh, and from policymakers saying we need to change, we have to change, and higher education is saying give me a reason, why do I need to change? So I think that will be uh, an activity that the group will, that the project will also need to undertake in terms of, you know, how are they going to address that within higher education institutions? Um, within the report itself and the conclusions, I'd also uh, make mention of the fact that students are also interested in micro-credentials. That was made that point was made earlier in the in the report, but was not included in the conclusions um, because they see that as an opportunity to stack their work. I also agree with what Claudio said that not all students um, are are ready to or understand how to take the initiative of stacking their work of creating these um, diplomas uh, to to use micro credentials to create their own diplomas, um, and I think that will be another challenge for the group. Um, we face within our, at the University of Oldenburg, we, we offer these opportunities for students to, to be able to create their own programs, um, to, to be able to, to stack their, uh, to, to do the stacking, to recognize prior learning assessment um, or prior learning, um, but they don't always take advantage of it. So my question there is, uh, why, is why are they not taking advantage of it? If there, if there really is a need, why are they not taking advantage of it right now? Um, is, it, is it because they don't feel it won't be rec it will be recognized by by uh, employers, or is it because the universities are 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 uh, not as flexible as they should be? Um, so I think perhaps uh, case studies uh, of of universities that are undertaking this at the moment uh, could be helpful uh, in terms of the OE pass learning passport. I agree with Deborah what Deborah said about alignment. Uh, my only feedback regarding the European Expert Workshop as an executive summary would be very helpful. There was a lot of really, really good information within that document, um, which I thought needed to be summarized uh, with specific themes. What's the current situation? What are the needs? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? I think that would that would really, really uh, communicate the message of, of that workshop uh, in a much more effective way. And I also gave quite a bit of feedback about Credentify as a tool. Um, but uh, I think that's going to be passed on by parents uh, to the team. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lisa. It is very valuable, and I also think that you shared one of some some of your comments in advance, so we, it's easier to build into the final uh, report and to summarize what the overall opinion was on the documents. And uh, now I would like to ask Helga to make her comments. Thank you. So I'd like to join my colleagues uh, in saying thank you for this report. I mean, it, it's really helpful uh, for someone who has not been involved in doing the research or the investigation eventually or uh, developing the tools. So I am, in fact, your target population in some way or another because I am running a center for teaching and learning uh, in a university that is very much, um, you know, research oriented eventually and, and um, kind of would like to, in a way, stick to its uh, autonomy. So in fact, what I would like to say here um, is that I particularly like the, the student perspective in the document, which, because I think that uh, if we pose the question, 
uh, why higher education institutions should eventually take into consideration micro-credentials. Um, I think that's because of their students, right? So, and, and I think, um, and I think uh, Lisa's point about why don't our students uh, take the opportunity, right, if we provide them the opportunity? I think this is a, this is a very important question, I think, um, and it, it's about actually the responsibility of the institutions. How do we as educators eventually help our students to grow their autonomy in making decisions, and eventually how do they use that autonomy to sort of um, argue for certain solutions which are needed by them rather than the higher education institutions, right? So, um, of course, this is a, this is a, this, this most probably is a, a very complex issue. But, uh, but I think higher education institutions, um, I think there, there is an interest, at least this is how I see it. So I'm not so negative about whether they would be willing to change eventually and, or change certain practices and approaches, and in particular about uh, micro-credentials. Because if you think back on the Mundus programs, like the joint degree programs eventually, or joint uh, PhD programs, I think it's the institution's decision to join forces eventually and through uh, a complex shared uh, degree program eventually uh, give degrees to students. So I think that's already um, a different approach uh, to uh, acknowledging and, and, and showing interest uh, towards uh, how other institutions teach and what do they teach and how could we eventually or how could they eventually uh, recognize the work that is done in other institutions. So I think, I think there are already initiatives uh, that, that uh, should make us feel eventually positive about this. Um, but of course, uh, as many of you said, there has to be some sort of an overarching or institutionalized um, sort of framework and an incentive structure uh, for institutions so that they um, eventually are willing, are willing to um, maybe give up on some form of their um, institutional uh, autonomy in that regard. Um, and uh, just to give you my, my own sort of um, experience, um, I run um, a program for a novice higher education teachers. Um, these are called uh, the Excellence in Teaching Programs. And, um, and I very often uh, get emails from other institutions in Europe primarily who ask about what types of courses our graduates, PhDs, um, take with us because then they actually acknowledge those. So I see this as, uh, of course, observational evidence, not so much uh, evidence per se, but there is already a thinking going on or sharing practices or sharing resources or documents eventually, for example, among centers of teaching and learning in Europe who actually train the next generation of university teachers. So for example, my, my, how I see this is that if there is, there are certain areas um, and foci or, or particular trainings, if you will, provided by many, many universities in the same area, then eventually through university networks, they could um, locate and identify those and maybe start uh, working on uh, sharing um, these um, um, sort of credentials eventually or trying to work for uh, sharing um, uh, these um, practices eventually. Uh, I, I think that's, um, yeah. I, I would have a couple of questions about from the institution's perspective how one could use the online platform, but I'll just uh, hold that back and eventually send those comments and questions in writing to you, so thank you. Thank you, Helga. You touched a very important issue at the very end of your uh, note. 
but uh, it really needs a much, much wider discussion than that. <coughs> I think it's a problematic <coughs> thing. And now I think I would like to ask George to make uh, his comments. George sent us uh, his uh, comments in writing also, but uh, since uh, he's, uh, I think, about the last uh, to comment here uh, in the living talk, uh, it is very, very valuable to, to give the floor to George. So, George, please. Uh, yeah, just uh, a brief um, uh, comment. Um, I, I just want to, to indicate that, uh, that I, I like the paper very much because it's from the uh, viewpoint of the stakeholders and, um, well, it giving also a, a good idea about the complexity of it all. Uh, it is very uh, relevant as, uh, for example, in the Netherlands now we have launched a, a new law on um, on not having a, a yearly um, fee for the university, but having a, a fee per module. So it is very important that we get um, good transparency and trust in the system and also work towards more tra uh, standardization. And therefore, the, uh, the stakeholders are uh, very important to, to get their views and bring them together. Uh, we also do that within our um, EU project on the European MOOC uh, Consortium for the Labour Market. Uh, where we have a yearly peer learning activity with the, with the stakeholders to also reflect on the, on the role um, uh, of micro credentials and the dialogue of having uh, developing the best system for that. And uh, I just uh, want to indicate that in this um, briefing paper, uh, 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 I'm missing the, the bigger role of the employment agencies, as we have the employment agencies as um, one of the, the bigger players in this. Um, uh, as they are the interlocutor between the, the, the companies and the educational institutions, I think they, have, they should have uh, also a very uh, prominent role in this uh, in this dialogue. Um, and further, I just wanted to indicate that uh, every time I'm, I'm, I'm working with, with the micro credentials and the definitions, I think uh, what is confusing now is that there, there are actually maybe two major de definitions. One is the, the broader de definition which uh, clearly indicates um, inclusion of certificates and badges, as there's also uh, another uh, definition of micro-credentials, like also in the Dutch acceleration agenda for, for innovating education, which explicitly said micro-credentials are not the same as badges and, and badges and certificates. Uh, so that's quite contradictory, but they are focusing on formal education uh, there. Um, so, these two definitions, and I hope in, the, in these dialogues with the stakeholders, we get a more a, a clear view when we are talking about microcredentials and what we are uh, actually meaning with this. Uh, with formal education, I therefore also believe that we have to give that, uh, that qualification a name, uh, a, a dedicated name, not just a microcredential, but really a name that reflects um, uh, the, the value of this microcredential in formal education. Uh, thank you, George. This issue of uh, the relation between badges and micro-credentials is very important, and it is not new in the literature. You might have read already that uh, in uh, that more than 10 years ago, it was already raised once whether these are overlapping or the same, or just uh, there is a small area that overlaps between the two. And for instance, as I mentioned, Mark, mentioned that they use micro-credentials and they also use a picture, a badge attached to the micro-credentials. So, uh, to my understanding, uh, there is some overlap between the two. And uh, if the, my, the uh, digital badge is constructed in a way that it has it have the, the same metadata as required for the formal uh, micro-credentials, then it is a badge and a micro-credential uh, in one. So, definitely there is some overlap between the two definitions. As, as far as I just uh, studied the literature, uh, you might have different opinion on it. It depends on the application, I think. So, uh, then I would like to ask whether anyone would like to respond to comments of others because there were some uh, slight uh, contradicting ideas, for instance, about the relation of um, digital badges and micro-credentials, uh, or whether uh, this is the primary importance of higher education 
for the, the importance mostly concerns the learners themselves and, and the like. And, and the issue of whether it's just for the education, high education or for, for lifelong learning or continuing learning, I don't want to open the discussion because this project was aimed at higher education uh, application of micro-credentials. And we know that the, the, the scope is much, much higher, much wider than that. And these micro-credentials is and are being used uh, in just acknowledging prior learning, acknowledging uh, uh, acquired skills and competencies uh, in open learning or non-formal learning or even informal learning. So this is the other direction. I know uh, we, I do not exclude that it could reach to that point, but no, we are just uh, dealing the application of micro in higher education context. So, Anyone would like to comment the first round? If not, then I would like to initiate the second round, which is about the, the uh, experience of your institution using the using micro-credentials or the uh, the validation or recognition of micro credentials and in general the future of this initiative in your institutions. So please raise your hands. Paul is starting the discussion. I ask Paul to start with. Thank you, Parents. It, it could, this question could really fit into either, it's one of these liminal questions that fits into either slot. Um, I, I think it may be from what you, what Parents was saying, maybe this is the future project or the next project, but certainly I, I um, as somebody who, of the kind of person who needs to be convinced would like uh, at some stage uh, you know, to follow this excellent report with a greater degree of granularity. And I'm very much minded by a wonderful paper that's just come out, which I've only just quickly read, which describes the COVID situation in about 40 countries around the world with a number of people online, who, Eva and others, who, who've authored sections. It is just absolutely wonderful. But why is it wonderful? Well, first of all, it's topical. But secondly, you get down to some really gut gutsy, gritty details about how it all went horribly wrong in some countries, in education as well as in other ways, and very much fresh from fresh from the fight. Um, I'm also reminded, in promoting one of, one of our own papers uh, with, with the JRC, the policy, some of you will remember this, some of you were probably interviewed, the policy approaches to orphan education in 2017, where we had kind of ministers trying to hide, in some cases, um, rather than be put in the spot, and, and some very you know edited interviews came out. But I think he just gave you a um, um, a very good feel for some of the decision making in countries about how they go, including countries where you'd have thought they'd be doing much more. I won't name any countries. You can read the report, uh, and that I think would be very useful. The last the last point I think is to get some um, historical perspective, including within institutions. Um, I'm reminded while I think of it that uh, those who think that individual learning counts are a good idea might want to cons consult some old people who remember how many millions of, of euros were lost the last time England tried this. But only a few of us are old. I live in a city which invented it. Only a few of us remember how badly wrong it went and how much the level of fraud was. Which doesn't mean it can't be done correctly. All I'm saying is it wasn't done well before. So I think from the institutional point of view, there are a number of things which, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Open University, and, and but it would apply to, to other distance teaching institutions and, and Derby as well. I think somebody already hinted about the regulatory problems. One of the bizarre reasons why a lot of investment money, to be blunt, is going into vocational online learning in, in the UK is because the regula regulatory climate is more conducive. Um, it's true in, the, in England, and I believe in the Netherlands, um, if one reflects on the history of the Dutch OU, that just when you want to be modular, the government comes along and says, no, you can't be. We're worried about completion 
We want to get outcomes. We're only prepared to fund degree programs. And, and this certainly, I know, caused a lot of issues within the Open University. I've heard it caused issues within the um, Open University of the Netherlands because they had to basically take a wonderful modular system and kind of put it back into, into degree programs, which the government wanted, um, but maybe the universities didn't want. So even when you try and be modular, you're rather vulnerable to a government coming along with a new vision, and that's the problem with new governments, new visions. And, and stopping you. And as I say, in vocational education, the funding is actually at the micro-credential level in, uh, in England, not at the degree program level. And so some people basically say, well, I think I'll call that vocational because it's easier. The syllabus, the assessment might be almost the same. This is the beauty of the higher vocational trick. A trick some of us learn from MOOCs, actually. Don't ever say if it's HC or not, because you get bogged down. And I'm very conscious with Lisa here, the U.S. institutions are quite careful about not quite saying that their CPD is higher education in any sense, which might um, generate higher level scrutiny. Book suppliers are quite careful at saying someone may wish to give this a credit value. We couldn't possibly comment. That's for other people, phrased in a kind of PLAR, APL universe. So I, I think this is where you need some of the devils in the detail, because, of course, if some big countries say, well, that's great, um, you know, we went to the UNESCO meeting or the EU meeting and said yes, but meanwhile, our regulators are saying not a chance. One has to kind of begin to, to get that out in the open. And I think, I think there, there are some issues with two issues I'll, I'll flag from a provider. I'm just, I've just led a two-year uh, micro-credential in, um, in teacher training for teaching online. And the modularization, as I remembered from my earlier open year essays, the modularization is the difficult part. How do you generate these freestanding modules which can be consumed in any sequence? A, a colleague of mine in the institution I mentor is just finishing an entrepreneurship modular program. You can take it in any order. That's tough when you're the, when the tutor for that, as well as being the student. So, of course, you make compromises and it can be done, but it's tougher, it's tougher than you think, especially when you do it at scale, as some of the big open universities do. And as I say, you then can get into kind of government pressure. And I think there are some student issues, too. Um, I, when I first joined Sheffield Hallam, I'm sorry to be boring and old, in 1996, I, I was told there was a really great idea which just come out from the Government Science Council called Modular Masters. So off we went did a modular master's distance education, never really worked. People said, look, I want the master's, what's this modular stuff? Yes, they went through tick-tock, tick-tock, through the modules in sequence. We never really had any demands. Okay, you would say it's a long time ago, but it isn't really in, in educational terms. So I, I question whether the student uh, um, demand is, is, is really there without seeing evidence. In other words, if people put it on, Will it, will it be taken up? And okay, it may be different in the US, and there are different there are reasons why it is different there. But I think to some extent, universities may be rather careful because some of them, like us, have been there before. So I would counsel caution. The other big thing I I, I feel is important is is the marketing side. People have mentioned marketing. Education is not as free as it used to be, and it's not just weird countries like England that make, make, make it expensive, especially for international students. The education may well be a lot less free after the, the current situation. So marketing is important. And, you know, if you're trying to market your under Indiana University has 135 online masters, even though the president of the institution doesn't seem to know about them, as he made evidence in a press conference the other day. When you try and change 135 online masters to 1,350 online masters modules, you can get this kind of chaff effect. They're trying to drill through, and suddenly the sky is full of chaff. And people still want, you know, the big institutions, the elite institutions, still want to get these big ticket masters programs uh, through. I'm taking masters because that's actually more amenable has been more amenable to modernization for a long time. For a start, there's a three-part structure to it anyway, certificate, diploma, and dissertation in, in many countries across the world. So it's kind of partly modernized anyway. But even so, I think institutions and students are cautious, even though I see no problem in the ECTS scheme. I never did. We never do. Um, to, to permit modular masters and indeed 
scaffolded undergraduate programs with our foundation degrees and certificates and diplomas we have at undergraduate. They're not widely used, which I think is partly due to student demand. But so I think it's a kind of dialogue we need. And, and you know, we, we, we might want the right structure. And I would also wonder whether it should be reg, whether, whether it helps institutions if it's seen as transgressive and, and, and disruptive and, you know, Christensen Institute kind of thing, because we know that these regulators are really nervous. Everyone tries to keep the National Student Survey online, the Quality Assurance Agency in your country online. They tend to like continuity. George will remember our discussions with ENQA in a previous project. Changing a few sentences can be quite hard work. So it, it may be helpful to promote this in two ways. One, it's disruptive in the long term, but there are conservative, you know, you know incremental ways of, 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 of taking the first few steps in the short term, because without the first step, the journey doesn't start. Sorry, that was more philosophical than I meant to um, say, but it's, that's how it's come out. But I think it, I'm trying to crystallize three or four different institutional dilemmas in, into, into you know, um, my, my point of view at the moment, plus a lot of other work that we've done, of course. Uh, thank you very, very much, Paul, about sharing your ideas about the dilemmas of the different institutions. So I would like to ask the other participants uh, to try to give answers to the questions of uh, part two of this discussion. What did your institution concrete plans to offer micro-credentials and whether you have plans to recognize micro-credentials as a new uh, institution, in which way and in which subjects? And also, uh, what do you expect from a user's guide on micro-credentials in higher education? So I think Lisa is raising her hand. I leave the floor to Lisa. Thank you, Ferenc. I already mentioned uh, some of those things that we're doing at University of Oldenburg, and, and I think I will need to make a distinction here between what's being done within the traditional uh, higher education environment of the university uh, and in our continuing professional education environment, because within the Center for Lifelong Learning, the courses that we're doing, where we're doing stacking, where we're doing uh, what, what could be defined as micro-learning, um, students have to pay for those courses, uh, whereas within the traditional university environment, they do not. So that could be a, a real uh, key distinction there uh, in terms of uh, whether or not you would want to consider the, the Center for Lifelong Learning as being a, a, an option to, to use as a case study. Um, and as I mentioned, we do, we do modulize our, our, um, our uh, programs. We offer prof professional certification modules of two, C two ECTS. We've got uh, advanced case studies, which are um, anywhere between um, five to 12 CTS, and then uh, diplomas of advanced studies, which are up to 30 um, ECTS. So, and, and as I mentioned, we, we, we are using prior learning assessment. So when students come in and say, I've taken this course, within another program or I've taken this uh, or I have this work experience, we'll take that into consideration and, and, and give the student credit for that, uh, for that experience. Um, and that's been something that the university has actually been uh, um, uh, a trailblazer uh, as this is something they came up with a, about a decade ago. Um, in terms of where we're going with it, right now we're doing uh, further micro-credentials, looking at how we can for example, um, use some of the um, give student certification for courses that they've already taken, for example, through a MOOC or through a free online uh, open educational uh, resource. Um, here I'm thinking about the OLN 201 course that, that's being offered uh, in Sweden. Um, many, of our, many of our students are taking that, the, uh, that course at the moment, and so we're looking at how can we integrate that open educational resource or that, that open uh, learning experience into our um, into our programs and, and offer them certification for that. Uh, so that could also be considered a form of a micro credential. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what we're doing uh, in terms of micro credentials. Uh, and 
in terms of the feedback on the user's guide, I think I misunderstood what was meant by the user's guide when we received the the, the form uh, to fill out uh, because I thought you were referring to a user's guide for the software tool. Um, so I'll need to think a little bit more about, about what exactly uh, we would need in terms of a, a user's guide. But my first reactions would be we need to know what's happening in the background. We need to know what the decision making matrix is. We need to know about the processes. And it needs to be easy to read uh, and easy to use. That's just my basic feedback. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I just would like to ask one more question from you. Uh, do you recognize micro credentials coming from different other institutions not uh, given by your institution? Yes. So I mean, and this is based on an agreement between the universities or it is based on standards? It's based on standards. Um, it's assessed by the, there's a group within the university, the, the, the prior learning, um, they, they, of course it's a German name, but um, the, they, they do prior learning assessment and recognition within that group for students at the university. Um, however, not a lot of students take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, what they, 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 I don't know if it's a marketing issue or if it's because they don't see a need to do that. Uh, within the Center for Lifelong Learning, where we offer continuing professional education, which is more for the working adult, uh, where they actually pay for the courses, we see a lot of students coming in and saying, okay, I want it, I want, I've got this work experience, and I have this certification, I've um, attended this workshop or this conference, uh, and then, we, then we'll put together a, a package for them in terms of what courses uh, they could opt out of and receive credit for. So that's how we do that. So that means that it's a third party, independent of your university, assessing different uh, no, uh, no, it's the university itself. The, the one is for the That's traditional good. university side, and it's within the university. And then um, there is the uh, Center for Lifelong Learning, and that's also a branch of the university, but it's more for professional students who are coming in as adults uh, for education. And, and that's also done within the center by the program directors and by a committee of people from the Center of Lifelong Learning. I see. It. So it's a kind of an investigating the uh, credential with more scrutiny. Yes. I see. Thank you. I don't think anyone raising his or her hand, but I am really curious about your uh, practice and expectations about the application of micro-credentials in your university. So, who is next? Vlad, it's your turn. Yes, thank you. Um, for me, it will be quite short since uh, our situation is a little bit complicated uh, in, uh, in my country. Um, there is a regulatory body, part of the education ministry, which uh, allows uh, accreditation for um, every program um, and also for the, every type of credentialing. Uh, this uh, body is very bureaucratic and uh, they are very reluctant to change. I'm sure that uh, uh, this sounds familiar for some of you, maybe not now, but I'm sure in, uh, in the past, uh, your, in your countries, this was the same. Uh, therefore, we don't have uh, any official plans for uh, micro-credentials in our university. We tried to uh, promote this in uh, three uh, aspects. First, via the European projects in which we are involved in and uh, in which uh, for, for the last projects, all of them had the uh, micro-credentials component and uh, we are seeing every time how we can uh, include and integrate those uh, micro-credentials into uh, the European passport and uh, uh, all other European uh, uh, recognized uh, um, bodies. The second aspect is related to um, 
some uh, some courses that we are trying to to get recognized by our university, some uh, postgraduate programs, uh, and uh, we have uh, at the moment managed to get the recognition for um, a diploma for a very short program, but. Uh, that diploma is recognized only by our university and the ministry does not allow us to transfer that so that if someone wants to, to transfer those, the abilities gained in that diploma uh, wants to, to, to get recognized in other parts. And the third aspect is uh, related to, to the pedagogy that we are doing. Uh, some of the teachers in, uh, in my uh, team uh, we are giving the students the possibility of following uh, other courses, such as MOOCs, of course, and uh, if they can uh, prove to us that they uh, receive the digital badge, then uh, with uh, uh, an examination uh, presentation that they do, we uh, give them a, like a grade for their exam. But this is a practice that we are using and uh, because we can decide uh, in which way we are going to do the examination. But this is not a common practice in, uh, in our country. So, at the moment, until uh, the micro-credentials will be uh, more promoted and until the uh, European Union will come with stronger recommendations for acceptance of, uh, of um, a more flexibility for the higher education in all countries, I don't see how we can uh, fight with, uh, with the regulatory body from the ministry. Um, related to the user guide, um, I, I think that uh, uh, clear instructions and explanations will be in order. Of course, I'm expecting it will be like this. Uh, I would like to see why I need to use micro-credentials, where I can use them, if I can integrate them in other uh, parts, um, how this will help me in my career, uh, and also I would love to see a Q&A section with the most common asked questions related to the topic so that I can easily find the answers I might be looking for. I think uh, these are my answers until now. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. It's very interesting how you proceed with application of uh, micro-credentials and that you have to fight with regulatory bodies. But uh, I think it is the case in all over Europe that regulatory bodies are strong and they are mostly focused on the traditional high education scheme, uh, scene and not uh, anywhere else. Uh, then I would like to ask Claudia Rondi to continue. Thank you. I think I, well, my, my institutional belonging is questionable to a certain extent, but I will refer here as uh, part uh, of uh, Unimore, University of Modena and Reggio Emilia in Italy. Uh, first of all, uh, three points. Uh, one is that uh, um, credential, uh, micro credentials in higher education are a questionable element, as I said before, of opening up higher education. And they are not totally coherent uh, with the first, because, if, of course, credentializing is an important part of the higher education business, uh, but opening and credentializing are not 100% uh, uh, working together. Having said this, uh, uh, we, we experienced all in, in these uh, last months uh, a, an increase uh, of uh, access to open education and MOOCs in particular and uh, um, an increase in the spontaneous initiative or not even spontaneous, in, apparently in China it was pushed, uh, um, initiative of the students to use open education worldwide. This may have changed uh, in principle, for sure, the awareness uh, and uh, potentially also the, um, the level of initiative uh, in students, the level of, uh, let's say, agency in uh, shaping their own uh, individual learning path. That must not be underestimated. But uh, from uh, an institutional perspective, where I see the, the potential, 
of course, uh, we have talked about continuing professional development as a, as a non-mainstream activity for most uh, higher education institutions. In some, it's different. The international component, the mobility abroad, the physical and the virtual mobility elements uh, where some micro-credential can be accepted and uh, relatively easily integrated. But I would like to point at an area that was mentioned by Helga before, and it's the area of teacher's education. That's the area in which our university is actually, after a European project that is going to finish soon, has developed some hypothesis of uh, micro-credentials for, uh, for school teachers covering areas related to lifelong learning key competencies. But the idea of also uh, experimenting the practice uh, of uh, micro-credentials for higher education lecturer is also quite an interesting one. And I would like to know more from Helga what they are doing because uh, as you, as you may know, on the 26th of May, also the Commission has produced conclusions on uh, teachers of the future, teachers and trainers of the future. And uh, in, uh, in one point, in one of the final points of these conclusions, they mention the, they encourage the use of micro-credentials for teachers' education and continuing professional development. And they uh, suggest the creation of European academies for teachers. So there is an area there that is not only politically opportune, because uh, opportunistic, let's say, because the Commission is pointing to that, but is also, I think, uh, uh, since uh, big innovation cannot be imposed but must be adopted, and the big part of academic body is made of teachers. If teachers don't experience on themselves the system, they will be not so oriented to, to make the big steps in changing their model of delivery and certification. So I think the area of teachers training, I would recommend to all of those interested as an area where probably something interesting can be done in the starting from this year and taking the wave of the fact that teachers have become aware in school and in higher education of some limits in their capacity to use technology to support teachers to reach the, the less favored students group. All of these things require working on the learning and support process much more than a normal from secondary education on teacher has been trained to being focused on a discipline, on uh, a certain content rather than on the process. So I think there is there a big challenge that can be interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. I feel the same. Uh, last November, there was, uh, just before the, the epidemic, there was a workshop in Brussels about the digitalization of education in general. And we also raised the point of building this subject into the teachers' uh, education and further education as well, uh, just considering it one of the more most important elements uh, uh, to raise the the, the uh, to, to to foster the digitalization in general and also the application of the digital credentials uh, in in this uh, uh, field. So I would like to ask now Helga to continue. Okay, I can jump in, although I think Mark uh, was before me eventually, but uh, you know, as you wish. Mark, are you okay with me jumping in? Cool, thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so just to, just to reflect uh, on my institution eventually, because that had been the original sort of um, question. Um, not much is happening, I have to say. So, and and I saw uh, Irina's um, question or or point about the digital infrastructure eventually. Um, so, I have to say that we are exploring uh, ways how to how to um, have more focus on micro credentials, and I think one approach certainly is in our institution to form university consortia. So eventually, based on that 
and through, to some extent, the European uh, University Association as well, um, so that we can eventually build uh, these relationships uh, to serve our students' interests. Uh, so this is one approach which has been um, explored and um, and and I think um, actually that is uh, grounded in a notion of of, uh, of the Mundus the good experience that we have been having with the Mundus programs eventually so that which started out as degree programs. So uh, so this is kind of the evolution of this approach and the other one is that our um, uh, I agree with Vlad that he refers to the accreditation aid and agencies right. But I also think that there there is some room for flexibility in terms of um, you know some percentage of uh, how the programs are being accredited and what are the types of courses which actually fit into the accreditation uh, of certain programs. So in that sense, I think there is some autonomy. Maybe this is the buzzword for me today. I'm sorry. Um, I, I think this is the third. Um, contribution that has like autonomy uh, but but honestly I mean the um, <clears throat> so there is some autonomy from the from the departments eventually or the program organizers or program uh, uh, directors to figure out okay so if there is a MOOC let's say or if there is a preparatory program uh, offered by another university then eventually they have the right and the autonomy to say that this is what we request from our students to do before they take this or that course. So we have already uh, a couple of uh, um, such uh, collaborations eventually um, between institu our institution and other institutions, for example, in economics, uh, but mostly, uh, or environmental sciences, mostly these courses which uh, which are acknowledged eventually and uh, and the credentials are of course also in a way um, inbuilt um, in the in the in our system um, are focused on preparatory courses or or um, uh, skills uh, courses um, such as um, quantitative analysis or statistical skills um, yeah or foundational uh, courses as such. So I think uh, what I'm trying to say with this that and again that there is some certain flexibility in the system I think at least for our institution and and the other is that I think there has to be I mentioned early on the institution's responsibility to make these decisions about their curricula and eventually their offerings to their students in order to be able to serve the needs of the students. And coming back to the, uh, the teachers, the university teachers' education, I think one approach that I think um, could be, and we are a couple of us are exploring, uh, that there are these uh, professional organizations uh, of um, uh, those of us who work in university teacher education as such. And then, of course, there is sort of the canon. There are some agreements about who teaches what and why. And I think this is this this discussion about uh, kind of establishing these agreements and acknowledgements and recognitions. I think um, has to be so. This discussion has to be taking place um, uh, at that level, certainly, and then moved to the institutional level. This is this is how I see it. But I we definitely see the need for this. We definitely see the need for this. That let's say our graduates. Who graduate, let's say, in a PhD program in philosophy, and they go to um, to teach in the UK, um, where is the teaching excellence framework, right? And they do two-year courses, a, a program basically for university teacher development. Then they get back to us and say, okay, so what does your program have that we can eventually acknowledge and recognize, so that you know the the our people or your you know, the new hire does not have to go through the same training, if you will. But a long way ahead. Thank you very, very much, Yaga. I think that in the higher education context, it's very important to have a kind of an agreement who teaches what and who acknowledges what part of other programs uh, in general, but it was already part of the old accreditation system used in Hungary, I know. So 
well, it is the basis how to acknowledge smaller pieces or chunks of learning experience, definitely. So I would like to give the floor to Mark now. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I thought I would just give a little bit of an insight at an institutional level, um, since I indicated previously and, and put a link in to some of the work that we've been doing in this area. The first point I would make is that um, in having gone through our internal regulations to formally define micro-credentials, because that's what you have to do at an institutional level if you're going to call it a credential, that's not a, a straightforward process. Uh, it involves uh, a lot of discussion with the academy, uh, with your colleagues to help them understand what it might be, a lot of debate, um, robust debate. So I have to give credit to um, uh, just over a year ago, the role that the common micro-credential framework played in helping to scaffold and help, in some respects, contain those conversations. Um, and uh, because we are a FutureLearn partner, um, FutureLearn was one of the key stakeholders in the development of that framework. So having a definition and having at least an indication of what might be seen as a common uh, framework got us down that path a lot further. But on the other hand, we also managed to identify the fact that micro-credentials already can be accommodated within the European Qualification Framework. And if you really want to think about it, a postgraduate certificate or a postgraduate diploma is effectively a micro-credential of a master's degree. And in some cases, people have certificates and diplomas at the undergraduate level. So it's not like we're completely reinventing the wheel when we're referring to stackable credentials, credit bearing stackable. Um, what we had to really tease out is, and we sort of see this on a, parallel, on a, a vertical and a horizontal axis when we're discussing micro-credentials. So on the vertical axis, you have credit bearing micro-credentials that are stackable and uh, from a university perspective, perhaps a little elitist, but we want to put most of our efforts into stackable and credit-bearing micro-credentials that fit within our portfolio of offerings. And also have, um, I referred to the three Cs, they have currency, they have uh, credibility, and they have coherence. Um, so that's really important. On the other hand, we do recognize on the horizontal axis, or sometimes this is referred to as almost like a honeycomb, how someone will put things into the honeycomb that they're interested in learning, sometimes just purely for self-interest. Sometimes it might be about new skills for work. There are multiple reasons why they might do that. And they're probably not as worried about the credit, the, the, uh, the stackability, um, even perhaps even the credibility, because they're just doing the learning. They, they, the learning is the learning. And all universities have um, responded in different ways with short learning programs to provide a richer curriculum, or sometimes it's referred to as co-curriculum. So it runs alongside um, of other activities. So in DCU, we have a very vibrant uh, university community, about 150 clubs and societies. Our students are actively engaged in volunteer work and internship work. So we do want to recognize some of the things that they're learning there, and in particular, you could now almost put a, tri a, a diagonal line against my horizontal and vertical one, which refers to transversal skills, because the development of some important transversal skills can occur in those activities. Um, but whether they need to be credit bearing is the crucial question for me in the definitions that we are struggling to come with uh, in current sort of discussions. Um, so at DCU, what we've done is made a really clear distinction between the credit bearing, the non-credit bearing. And I think George made this point as well. Uh, badges, certificates, um, and so forth are not necessarily micro-credentials. That will, of course, come down to ultimately how we define them. But there are lots of occasions when I just get a badge uh, that's been um, when I facilitated a webinar or something like that, I certainly don't see it as a micro-credential and I'm not sure our students would in a similar way in their context. But at the, um, in summary, at the institutional level, 
Um, this is not an easy thing. It doesn't happen quickly. We all know that big organizations, particularly universities, don't happen to uh, act uh, as quickly as sometimes we would like. What we're doing in Ireland, um, this is a conversation that's been interrupted by COVID-19, is trying to look at what we might do across the universities to provide that coherence and consistency with a framework perhaps emerging. Um, but that work hopefully will align with what the European Commission's involved in as well. So thanks. Thank you, Mark. I think I fully agree with your opinion that Digital badges are ne not necessarily uh, credentials, digital credentials as such, and I do not think that the, this uh, is questionable, uh, questionable. It is, I think, self uh, uh, self evident. Uh, I think that if there are the same metadata and the same uh, credibility behind a digital badge, it might be. Uh, digital uh, micro credential as well at the same time. So they are just overlapping, but not fully overlapping. There is some overlap between the two. Thank you. And uh, then I would like to ask the other participants whether to comment on the other part of the set of questions. I mean, I didn't have much. Uh, on your opinion, uh, on your feedback, on the information presented and discussed in this workshop. And uh, well, we have got some uh, information on your related initiatives in the field already in the chat box and also in the discussion as well. So what is your feedback on the information presented today? Anyone to start with? Okay, I can jump in. Um, so I, I think I, I, I very much value the multiple perspectives eventually uh, that have been brought in in this discussion. Because uh, I, I tend to think that we are locked down in our own silos in higher education. And we also tend to ignore that, um, that the, the different um, types of uh, education that we provide in our institutions make sense together. And they should be we should be constantly reminded that there, there are these uh, types of, um, uh, you know, um, education basically or services if you will to have the post liberal um you know jargon again dropped in um but so i think we have to we have to keep in mind uh, that there is uh, these these um um multiple approaches uh are integrated and should be integrated and we have to reflect upon our own practices we can we can learn from each other how a professional development program is run for example, uh, has a lot to do, you know, or has a lot to teach us eventually um, in terms of how we run a master's program uh, that is very much practice based or, you know, um, how PhD programs are run, I think, especially in the current context. I think uh, we have to reflect upon how transversal skills eventually um, how lifelong learning skills are integrated in PhD programs so that they make sense, right, uh, in, uh, in, in the current society. So I really appreciate these perspectives. And I also appreciate um, that uh, colleagues are thinking about solutions, like very practical, hands-on, uh, openly available solutions to uh to make these uh, once these agreements right once these agreements are hammered out that that those institutions have actual practical solutions eventually to test and try out how to have the hands on eventually certifications or uh, acknowledgement recognitions so so thank you for that so thank you for sharing that with us
application uh, uh, scope of applying uh, digital credentials. And uh, I have to express my thanks for your interest, for your active participation, and for your contribution to developing to this concept, and also for sharing uh, your own initiatives in the field, which I will just make note of it, and I will build it into the final document about this uh, discussion. And I would like to invite you all to, to our uh, yearly conference uh, in, the, in two weeks, uh, ten, ten days ahead, the Eden Conference 2020, which we will organize virtually. You can find information on the registration to this conference on our web page, and also we get a special conference page uh, to, to ease your joining to the conference. You are all welcome, and uh, I have to, to uh, notice note for you that there will be a special day devoted to micro-credentials uh, in that conference uh, with a full day program. Uh, with Anthony Camilleri starting with a keynote and uh, followed by three uh, sessions discussing the, the three different aspects of the development of this micro-credential uh, thing. And if you participate in, uh, would like to participate in the uh, conference, uh, we can offer a kind of a, um, virtually free access to the conference. If we invite you, you ind indicate that you are interested, we can invite you to the conference and then your participation fee will be covered by the micro HE program. That's one that I can offer if you are interested. So please feel free to send me a note and I will put you on the list of, particip uh, of uh, interested participants and then you can register uh, on the conference page. So thank you very, very much. And then I close the session now. Thank you. Goodbye.